So I'm your host, Gregory Fry, and we are breaking format today with a very special guest, Adria Petty. Adria is a filmmaker, an artist, and she is the eldest daughter of rock legend Tom Petty. When I heard that Adria had collaborated with Willie Nelson's daughter, Annie Nelson, to create a new cannabis product in Tom Petty's honor called Wildflowers, a cannabis tea available through Willie's Reserve, I just had to try and get it, get her for an interview. And here she is, Adria Petty. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing so great. Thank you so much. Um, Annie Look, knows I, it's actually Willie's wife, but it's uh, oh okay. Thank you for that correction. Thank you for that. I look. I I love Tom Petty. I love his music. I grew up listening to Tom Petty. When I was in elementary school, I permanently borrowed the cassette tape for Full Moon Fever from my stepfather and played it over and over again. And um, so it means a lot to connect with you and. and when I first heard about wildflowers tea, it, uh, my initial reaction was how apropos th th this is, and, and especially in that all the proceeds are, are going to Music Cares, which is awesome. And I, I wonder first you, if we could talk about uh, the story behind wildflowers tea and how this came about. Well, a few years back, um, it's probably like three years now, we were recording one of my dad's unreleased songs with Willie Nelson and Micah Nelson and Lucas Nelson, who's a good friend of mine and um, someone I admire and love deeply as an artist and friend. And I got the pleasure of meeting Willie's wife, Annie, and she had opened Willie's private reserve with Willie and had started, you know, baking and experimenting with different CBD products um, to kind of get body aches and sleep and, um, anxiety curbed just within their own personal use. And they started selling teas and coffees um, under Willie's brand, which they gave me. And then when COVID hit, you know, we ended up using that tea a lot, like, and finding the benefits of CBD to be pretty legitimate. And um, that way of taking it to be something pretty lovely and a nice ritual that didn't burn you out, um, but still gave you the benefit of the cannabinoids and um, time went on and they asked us if we would like to do something with them. And we started to think about, you know, we had so much success with wildflowers. We, there were so many things we wanted to do in a world that wasn't a COVID world, um, especially because it was so hard to manufacture or create the things that we wanted during that time um, to commemorate the record. Um, but we did a good job of it. And in the second year, last year, when we put the film out, we were able to pull together the Willie's Tea. Um, and they just went through this really nice process of sending us different, you know, things to test and whatnot. And we settled on this beautiful mint chamomile tea and used it for like a year before releasing it. And as a family, I mean, we all we really want to give um, you know, to charities regularly, uh, charities that we feel really are effective and accessible to the people in need. And we love Music Cares, our dad loved Music Cares, and um, it's affected even people in my daughter's father's family, you know, he's a musician. And um, when people have been in need, they've been able to reach out to Music Cares and get help uh, readily. And it's helped, you know, our family members uh, and people outside of the petty circle um, that have really kind of said, look, without Music Cares, I really would be up a creek. So I thought, you know, that would be a good uh, fitting beneficiary to this collaboration. And so did my sister and my stepmom. And we uh, decided to do this tea with Annie. And we're just super proud of it. It's been wildly successful. It's a great product. There's a there's a purity to the whole thing that that I think I think that's what makes it so apropos in my mind because it's my understanding that's 
that's what Tom Petty was after, purity in, in his work and just listening to the conversations with Tom Petty audiobook. Um, that came that struck me. And and you know, with his songs, they're some of his songs have some of the most iconic weed references in, in music, in my opinion. Uh, you don't know how it feels. Uh, don't pull me over, which I think you did the video for. Yeah. If, if I, and, yeah, I did. and, and may, maybe Mary Jane's last dance, he, he, I don't think he ever said whether it was about cannabis or not, but I like to think it is either way. It's such a powerful song. And, and he was always uh, fairly candid about cannabis in the media. And I, I wonder what is there to say from your view, from your experience about your father's relationship with the plant and, and his thoughts around cannabis in general? My dad loved smoking pot. I mean, that's pretty well documented. Um, and it was definitely sort of a weed culture around the band, even though I think it'd be fair to say that the rest of the band didn't really smoke weed. Um, mm. I mean, I'm sure they all tried it. And I know Ron Blair, you know, enjoyed it in the 70s or whatever. But none of them were sort of like as died in a wool, in the wool, a stoner as my dad, you know, and some of his longtime crew. And it was just sort of like a part of his alchemy, like coffee and a joint, you know. But my dad was really unique in the sense that, like, he really just liked to roll, like, one joint and nurse it for, like, a day or two or like take a tiny hit off of, you know, a pipe. He wasn't trying to get obliterated with marijuana. I mean, he liked to have like a little bit sort of send him off in a direction and then be very aware, very productive. He was very much like organized on time, you know, um, and used it as sort of a gateway to open creativity and to sort of soften the day, I don't think he was really into chasing the high. Um, like mm. my dad never had like a bong or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he, he he had like this beautiful box with his weed and he would roll a little joint and he'd enjoy it um, over a period of time or with friends. He loved to smoke pot with friends, at, you know, Christmas or whatever. But, um, you know, he was a really uh, fun person to get stoned with and, and very funny and um, <laughs> very creative. And, you know, he found pot to be really helpful, I think, in the creative process. Mm. It, it sounds like he really knew how to respect the plant and use it as a tool and a wellness product. Inadvertently, yeah. I mean, the thing that's so... So, so challenging now for me is a lot of times people like associate my dad with drugs um, because he died of like a combination of uh, prescriptions, uh, but he really didn't get into drugs, drugs, except for a short period of time in his life. He really just smoked pot. He didn't even drink really. So was, it was funny. When, it, when he, when he passed, you know, it was, it was so sad and, and it, to hear that prescription medication was a part of it I, you had i had to wonder if if cannabis was still part of his life in the end or not and if it would have helped or not i think he was just completely i mean i think he did over a couple hundred shows and was just completely mm -hmm. in pain and yeah. probably not aware of his schedule or what he was doing or taking at that point yeah but it was definitely directed he, by some pretty serious pain. Mm. Did, he, did he ever share any insights about whether or not um, to use cannabis before a, a performance? Um, I don't think he did use a lot of cannabis before performing. He liked to be in good voice. And I mean, I, I've seen him like smoke a joint at the end of a show or like towards the end of an encore or something. He wasn't really, I mean, occasionally he'd be like smoking up there, but I really didn't. He really saved it for winding down and relaxing and, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. Um, I wonder if you, if you have a, a cannabis story of your own that you'd like to share. 
Gosh, I, I mean, not anything in particular. I mean, I love cannabis. I think it's great for people um, of anxiety or who are creatives or not really um, into drinking or, you know, are looking for a way to kind of wind down but not be on sort of like a edgy, addictive, treacherous road with something. Um, I'm a believer that it, it helps people. Um, but my dad was really, I mean, like my dad never smoked pot with me until I was like 21, you know, I was really strict about using it as a controlled substance because it's not something I take lightly either. I think cannabis is just as powerful as alcohol and it can be addictive. It can be destructive to your motivation. Um, but if you use it the right way, if you respect the plant, as you were saying, I think it can be a really helpful um, agent for creativity and for getting out of your own head and for dropping anxiety, um, at least for me. Yeah, great for uh, the flow state when you're focused on a creative project, at least certain phases of the project. Yeah. I I wonder as this cannabis industry emerges, you know, naturally cannabis freedom is a good thing and not arresting people for it. I wonder if you have any impressions of how the cannabis industry is unfolding. Well, it's kind of cool. I mean, to like my daughter grew up in Los Angeles where cannabis is pretty much legal and accessible to anyone and can be delivered to you and, you know, you see a lot of moms like with their weed pens or whatever, you know, it's like a, there's a different kind of lifestyle with it there where it is normalized to the point where it's like a glass of wine and it brings people a lot of comfort and joy and allows people to kind of get silly and enjoy themselves as adults um, to be able to take a couple hits off a weed pen and spend the afternoon with their friends as opposed to getting schnockered on three bottles of wine, they can't drive home, you know, there's like a different lifestyle surrounding it um, that I think is nice. Um, and I now live on the East Coast where that's really not, there's not really any states over here that have gotten to that point where like weed is part of the culture and the lifestyle and is like acceptable around, uh, you know, people. It's like still like a little, like you pull out a joint at a party, it's like, ooh, you know, but I think it's, mm. it's cool to normalize it. I think that it's, uh, it's been hiding in plain sight for years. And it's really like, not just for us bohemian artists in the dark of the night, you know, for sure, bringing bringing it out of the shadows and into the light. Yeah, why not? I the, the you now wildflowers tea. You know, it's named after what Tom Petty I think considered his masterpiece, the Wildflowers album. And you were part of a documentary project that came out about that last year. Documentaries on YouTube, by the way, awesome some documentary and, and you mentioned it earlier. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the archive work that you've been doing. Well, I mean, Wildflowers is my dad's last project that he did uh, before he went on what would be his final tour. So it was really important to him. He talked to the press a lot about it. He talked to us a lot about it. And, um, you know, he had been working in his little sneaky laboratory where he made all the magic and had a double album finished, but he'd brought it back from the label to keep working on it because he wanted to add more stuff. And I think he had been very precious about like, you know, his process, his demos. And he was really thinking about it as an, a short album that he could then tour with a lot of people um, in these premium theaters. And then when we had the responsibility of kind of going back and looking at everything, um, which was like unbelievable. It was like readers. It was like, wow, there's so much here. There's so much writing. There's so many demos. There's 
such an insight into his process. Like I never knew how he made these songs so great or how he took them to the band or how he worked with producers um, to this extent until we opened up that vault. And um, we just did a really diligent job of going through that stuff and we were making a movie, but unfortunately it was not possible to get the film done by the time we put the record out and the film came out a year later and we decided that we'd like it to be available to people everywhere because it's such an uplifting project and it's such a beautiful masterpiece of a, a record and also a double record um and such a great window into who my dad really was like when he wasn't a rock star when it was just like a confident and sort of middle-aged like sweet human being and there was all this fly on the wall footage um, where you could really feel like you're hanging out with them. Like my cousin the other day said, that's the, felt like the first time I spent time with my uncle since he died, you know, uh, is watching the Wildflowers film. And for us, um, it just was a huge achievement to be able to pull something like that together at that stage of the pandemic when things were so challenging and get the interviews done. Um, I ended up running up and getting the interviews with Mike and the band before we even started the film because they were all, Rick was leaving, I was leaving LA and who knew where anybody would end up being after that. Um, and there was just, um, I don't know, sort of a magical glow on the whole wildflowers trip all the way down to this tea. I mean, it's just been, um, for something to do during a global pandemic, it's just been the most uplifting music to work with. It's been such a joy to reconnect with the people involved with making that um, record and to really be able to honor and love my father throughout the process of going through these archives and working with um, young and old people that were you know, part of our camp and people who are two generations younger than that, who just really love the music and love the man. Um, we've we've been able to get some really incredible love um, out of the Wildflowers Project in terms of like doing incredible illustrations or incredible archive work or um, look at an understanding of you know the anatomy of a song. There's been um, just a beautiful, wonderful process behind the last two years of really being completest about this because, you know, my sister, my stepmother and my mother and I, you know, in, in our role, we're really just midwives. We, we're, we didn't create this work and uh, we're just keeping the flame, you know, trying to make sure that we're protective of Tom and the way he liked to do things. Um, but there's such an awesome, awe-inspiring responsibility going through this stuff and really saying, look, we might be the last people that actually knew him that touch these things and are able to set them up for future generations. And I think um, in the case of Wildflower, it seems like we did a lot of stuff, but we also did a lot of stuff to make sure, you know, the, that the legendary status of that record is cemented in time, you know? and that it's there for my child and her children and um, that it will have the soul and the depth that my father deserved. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you, you mentioned were, you were acting, the, acting, acting as a acting sort, of sort of midwife about the, about the, oh, that echoes that really echoes. bad now. I don't hear it. Um, it's my, microphone i'll try to talk more softly i think that helps okay that was it 19 minutes okay um you mentioned acting as sort of a midwife uh, around this project and I, you know the cool thing is that you you're you're already an artist and a filmmaker and i wonder how a project like that um influences you as an artist and, and, and you mentioned it before in another interview that uh, your father was very um, supportive of, of you wanting to be a director and I, I just I wonder what is there to say about his his influence on you as an artist and, and your work as an artist and a, and a filmmaker in general and 
and what compelled you towards uh, directing? I mean, he really pushed me to be a director. He was like very um, encouraging and discouraging of other things I wanted to do. You know, he was uh, very influential. A lot of people even said, like, how do you say no to Tom? Like, you know, my dad and in, in your face saying, I think you should do this. You're going to try to do it. Um, he was um, just awesome. Every step of the way of my career. I mean, he was very... Um, you know, he cut me off financially after college. He was very like, go get your work experience. I'm sure you'll land on your feet. And every directing job, I could get him on the phone and be like, will you look at this edit? What do you think of this? No matter if it was for soap or it was like an R&B video, he didn't care. And he would look at it and talk me through it. And we would sort of go on that journey together uh, like any normal parent and child, you know, but he was ultra supportive. Um, for me to have a great work ethic, for me to have a great attitude, um, for me to be, um, you know, similarly to him, I was traveling around the world doing commercials and music videos for 20 years. So it was a lifestyle. I wasn't obviously like famous or some amazing artist, but, um, but I have my own voice and creativity and all that stuff. And I think he was really proud of that. And I'm really proud that he got to see so much of that before he passed away because he was, you know, it was super proud of me, not to my face. My, you know, he would say it when I was out of the room to other people, how proud he was of me, but he was always um, pushing me to be better and be more awesome than I already was. And he, he was very um, encouraging and cool, you know, he's my best friend. I miss him so much. Hmm. Hmm. You, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the big things you learned from your father, any, any big life lessons or, or values that, that he, he instilled within you. My dad, um, I mean, a lot of his parenting was based on being cool or not cool. <laughs> there was a lot of, uh, I think about that a lot. Of, now that I'm a parent, like, oh, that's not cool. Don't do that. You know, like a lot of people will let their kids be annoying and just say nothing or, um, and, and I'm not necessarily saying my parents' parenting school is my favorite, um, but they were really, I mean, my parents had me when they were like 21 and 20. But um, I think he lived his life off of like really kind of creating an environment of cool and safety and mastery um, where you really needed to be um, sharp in the wit and good at what you're doing and demonstrate that by doing it. Um, he used to often say, if you're talking about your career, you don't have one. And I think that that is indicative of like when you're saying he wanted to be true or you want to be authentic, it's like, he felt authenticity came through craft. It came through reliability. It came through decency. It came through um, a pure channel. And it was a channel that was like open to everyone. And, um, you know, that's what I learned from him. And that's what I continue to try to practice in my life. I mean, you know, we um, would love to, I'd love to say we're normal folks, but this has been an abnormal life and life experience, you know, to be Tom's daughter has been strange. And um, at the same time, you know, we really didn't like get dressed up and go to red carpet galas and stuff like that. He wasn't that guy. And we spent most of our life in a pretty low key way, like doing our work and doing it well and trying to treat people well and trying to put out something that, I mean, in terms of me as my own, my own career, like anything that I directed, I fought to make sure that it was going to be good 20 years later, you know, while I was in the middle of that job. And, you know, the, the edit, the color, the costumes, the effects, the finishing, whatever, I would always look at it like I want this to stay, you know, stay on the test of time and be a good piece for a long time. That I definitely got from my dad. My dad, the fact that like American Girl is like over 47 year old song or whatever. And it's still like the best song ever. That's that's like a testament to 
how my dad distilled all the things that he felt were like timelessly good about the music that he listened to and was influenced by, you know? And I think um, trying to do that with everything that you do and really aiming for that bar when you work, um, it can be torturous, but the way that you do it is because you're so facile with craft. Like you have practiced, you have been at the grindstone a lot and you've thrown out a lot of ideas and you know when an idea is good, you know. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Adria, this has been an awesome conversation and I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to add. Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. A, a big thank you to our wonderful guest, Adria Petty. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out Wildflowers Tea from Willie's Reserve if you live in the U.S. And feel free to give us a review, a like, or a share. And for more bluntness in your life, you can find us on social media or directly at the source, thebluntness.com. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow,